Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's March 17th, 2018. Uh, we are recording this uh, episode of Mormon Stories in front of a live audience at Community of Christ Building in Holiday, Utah, in Salt Lake City. Uh, we are so happy to have have an overcapacity crowd to be celebrating someone who is very important um, to Mormonism and specifically to liberal and progressive uh, Mormons, uh, post-Mormons, and also uh, the Mormon historical community. And that is Dr. Gregory Prince. Can we give Dr. Prince a warm, hearty Mormon Stories welcome? Uh, I'm so thrilled that you showed up and packed the house on a snowy Saturday evening. I don't know what else you'd have to do on a St. Patrick's Day than this, but we're so delighted that you're here. Um, this is something that we've started to do. Actually, we have a bit of a history of doing this in terms of bringing uh, people together and celebrating people that are really important to us all. I think the first time we did this was with Michael Quinn way back in 2011, 2012. But since then, we've held special events to honor Grant Palmer, um, Carolyn Pearson, uh, and who else? Anyone else I'm missing? Uh, Tova, yeah. So, so the idea behind this, and we want to do many more, is that there are so many people who, who really uh, have paved the way. There's so much going on right now in Mormonism. The church is changing in sort of an accelerated uh, pace, some would say, um, light speed given given the rate of change that they've made in the past 150 years. And the truth is, while blogs and podcasts and Facebook and Twitter are all really cool, uh, so much of the work that's going on today, including Sunstone, uh, is standing on the shoulder uh, shoulders of giants. And and certainly there are many, uh, many important people who have made uh, so much of what we do today possible. And the reason why we're holding this event tonight is to honor uh, one of those people, um, and his name is Dr. Greg Prince. We've had him on Mormon Stories several times. In fact, as most of you know, he's the very first person I ever interviewed for a uh, Mormon Stories podcast. Um, I have a few books of his here. Um, his very first book is called Power From On High, The Development of Mormon Priesthood. Uh, those of you who haven't studied Mormon history uh, uh, will be interested to learn that the priesthood didn't just sort of evolve in a uh, monolithic, uh, simplified, uh, easy-to-understand way. There's lots of bumps and uh, confusion and muddling along the way in terms of how the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood developed. And that's what this book uh, tackles. Greg, how many years did you spend uh, writing this book? Eight. Eight years, right? So it's a labor of love. Um, Greg, of course, followed up Power From On High with the book that many of you have read. How many of you have read David O. McKay and the Rise of Modern Mormonism? Right, at least half of you. This is definitely one of the most important books in, uh, in 20th, 21st century Mormonism, and it's about the prophet David O. McKay, and it's an excellent read, and it's the reason we brought Greg on to Mormon Stories uh, to begin with. And then those of you who really follow us will know that yesterday on Mormon Stories podcast, we interviewed Greg about his third book, uh, Leonard Arrington and the Writing of Mormon History. Uh, we did a good four hours yesterday covering this book, and it's a really important book chronicling sort of those Camelot years of Mormon history from 1972 to 1982. And again, so much of what we have today in terms of new Mormon history, scholarship, uh, CES letter, Mormon Think, all the blogs and podcasts uh, definitely comes out of the great history that sprang out of the Leonard Arrington years. So, um, these are three wonderful books, and if that weren't enough, and, and Greg tells us he spent eight years on each of those three books, that's 24 years just between the three books, and then he's about to publish his uh, fourth and final book. Tell us about that book really briefly, Greg. The title of that is Intended Actions, Unintended Consequences, The Mormon Church's Responses to Homosexuality. That is in press now. It's in press now. I'm going to move that mic a little closer to your mouth. And uh, it's in press now, and it's going to uh, it's going to make a big difference uh, in the LGBT community and within Mormonism. So, uh, Greg, we're so honored to have you here. We're so grateful for uh, your work. And, uh, Thank you. And let's give him one last final welcome to Mormon Stories Podcast. So tonight we're going to do a combination of. Uh, uh, 
I'm going to ask Greg some questions, but also we're going to have questions from the audience. I want to cover um, at least at least sort of a couple areas. One area is um, sort of uh, Greg's observations of, of Mormonism in the church today, kind of where we are. Also, want to reflect on um, his his own personal faith and his perspectives, and then we want to be able to take uh, questions from you. Uh, from the audience. And so I want to begin, uh, you know, uh, with this question. Greg, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of progressive and especially post-Mormons uh, are frustrated and confused by you. Did you know that? No. No, you didn't know that? Raise your hand if you've ever been frustrated by, by Greg Prince in my interviews with him. Raise your hands high. All right, there's a few of you out there. And I think it's rooted in just sort of this standard question that I always get, which is how can someone, uh, how can someone know all the history and remain engaged in the church? And uh, we'll be covering that a little bit uh, during our time together tonight. But I thought I'd begin by just asking you, do you have some maybe of your fondest church memories, your fondest church experiences? What are those? Because I'm guessing that uh, in many instances, it's the emotion that ties us to the church. And I'm just wondering if you have, you know, some fond memories of your church engagement that, that might be somewhat of what anchors you to the church. Over the past year, I've gone back and reread my missionary diaries. I started a diary when I got my mission call and still am keeping one. I wrote about 1,400 pages when I was in Brazil and didn't go back and look at it for a long time, that was really a transformational experience over a period of two years. I went, well, I think a metaphor for what that mission did in, in a major way to me is that I took a copy of Bruce McConkie's Mormon Doctrine to Brazil and came home without it. Hmm. Why'd you leave it behind? Because it no longer resonated with me. I don't know that it resonated very strongly when I went down, but that was 1967. Uh, and it just seemed like an interesting book to take along. But by the, by the time you were done? By the time I was done, I was done. And can you articulate what about, can you remember anything about what you read or your observations about the book that made you want to leave it behind? I, I think I may have been wired from birth to become a scientist. That certainly is what attracted me, even from a time that I was in elementary school. And the approach of saying, we have all the answers, they are in concise form, just memorize this and you'll be fine, did not resonate with me. And I found that book really to be a, a counterproductive book for me, and I've subsequently found it to be counterproductive for other people because you cannot reduce religion just to a series of one-liners. I think uh, Bruce McConkie's intentions were noble, but I think that's an errand that can't be succeeded at in the long run. What made you feel like you were allowed to discard the book written by an apostle? Like, uh, I, I think about many of us being just really orthodox as missionaries and feeling like it's not our job to decide what we're going to discard or not discard. It's our job to kind of obey and follow. What made you think you could do that? Because he wasn't an apostle. At the time, in the late 60s? That wasn't until the early 70s? So he, he wrote it in the late 50s. Yeah. No, uh, I think that, that you have to evaluate writings and even speeches on the basis of what's being written and said, not who is writing or saying it. Lester Bush has been one of my dearest friends for over 40 years. We used to be in the same ward. We now live only about 10 minutes apart. And when I was Elders Quorum President, reach, to go with your original question, was my most cherished experience, four years as being an Elders Quorum President. That's where I really saw how the church can function in a way that makes a real and lasting difference in people's lives. But Lester, when I was... Was that in, was that in uh, Maryland? Yeah. Where you were Elders yeah. Quorum President? Mm -hmm. uh, when I was the president, I had Lester teaching the class for a while. And he did one exercise where he took five quotations and then mixed up the authorship so that half of the quorum 
unknowingly got the right authors, and the other half got the wrong authors. Some of the authors were LDS, and some of the authors were recognizable historical figures within the United States, but not LDS. But the same quotations. And when we tabulated them at the end of the lesson, it fell out about the way that you would expect, that they agreed overwhelmingly with what they thought was written by a Mormon and were very tepid about the same quotations if they thought they had been written by a non-Mormon. And I think that speaks to, to a hazard that we have that we tend to give too much leeway on the basis of the title a person has rather than what they're really saying and how pertinent to our world that is. Tell everyone, if, for those who don't know, what, what was Lester Bush's maybe crowning achievement in Mormon history? And in life. Uh, Lester is a physician. He had no training in historiography. Uh, we had our relationship really by fluke because when Jalen and I moved to Maryland, we bought a house in Gaithersburg Ward having no idea that Lester and Yvonne had moved into that ward a year earlier. But when he was in his residency at LDS Hospital, he pursued a long-time interest in trying to figure out what was the historical basis of the church's policy on non-ordination of males of black African ancestry. And he dug where nobody had dug before, uh, is a brilliant intellect, and wrote a seminal article for Dialogue, published in 1973, that outlined the history of the policy and showed, in fact, that it was a policy, that it was never certified as revelation, and that it came in late in the game. That in Joseph Smith's lifetime, there had been several African-American men ordained to the priesthood. That was published in 1973. In 1978, something happened, and there was a direct line between the two of those that we had assumed for many years, but we had confirmed in 2009. Uh, a friend of mine, Brent Rushforth, who was on the board of editors of Dialogue when Lester's book uh, article was published in 1973, uh, had house guests, one of them being a grandson of Spencer Kimball, who was married to a daughter of Jean Enkland. And he just uh, was talking during dinner while they were back there for the Obama inauguration and said, we have always wondered if Lester's article had any influence on your grandfather. And he said, you don't need to wonder, because not long after my grandfather died, I was in my father's basement and found my grandfather's copy of that issue of dialogue. He said, my grandfather had a habit of having a red pencil in his hand whenever he read, and he would underline and make notations, uh, and he said virtually that entire article was underlined. So it was a very important article, the most important article I think that dialogue has ever produced. I would argue it's the most important article on Mormonism published in the 20th century, and there was a direct line between that article and what happened in 1978. There were a lot of other things that happened in the intervening years as well, but there's no question that Lester has had a permanent and benign effect on the course of the Mormon Church. So, your mission experiences, serving as Elder Quorum, any other fundamental emotional experiences that tether you to Mormonism? <clears throat> Brent Rushford, the same one I just referred to, told me that he used to chat with Rex Lee when Rex was the president of BYU, and he said Rex was on the High Council one time and told Brent that he had calculated that the most favorable glory-to-work ratio in the church was the High Council. Most and glory to the least amount of work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they always assume you're somewhere, so you don't really need to be anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and my three stints on the High Council were really quite enjoyable, mostly because of the opportunity to visit wards and try to keep people awake during sacrament meeting. I always asked the bishop if there was a topic that he wanted me to address, and I always did so if he had a favorite, but very often he'd say, just 
whatever you feel inclined to do. Now, this was in the the 2000s that you were in the State High Council, right? It, yeah, it was on three three times that I was on the High Council. But during kind of For a over total the, of probably 10, 12 years. Yeah, and while you were working on a couple of these books. Yeah. So, so at least you were considered sort of welcome enough or the church considered you a friend enough to allow you to have a stake high council calling while working on these books. Yeah. That's super cool. All right. So um, have you had any really bad experiences with the church personally? And if so, what are some of your worst church memories? Well, anybody who is going to publish objective interpretive history is likely not to have a real warm reception in some quarters. And I could say, well, I've been treated poorly along the way, but having lived through what Lester lived through, where he was really shunned for years and years. What happened to Lester? There was never any disciplinary action, but he was just marginalized. At a time when the Office of Seventy was removed from the local church and became the general office, then all of the stake 70s were ordained high priests. At the same time, virtually anybody who had reached the mid-30s and was still walking was ordained a high priest. Lester wasn't. And that was a very strong signal. I talked to the stake president, who was a next-door neighbor of mine, and said, you've got to fix this because this is not going to end well. And he kind of mumbled and said, yeah, he'd do something about it, but he didn't. And I think he was probably under directed not to. I also lived next door to Juanita Brooks when I was a student at Dixie College. And Will Brooks, in his 80s, was our home teacher, lived with my grandparents. I later learned a lot about Juanita that I hadn't understood at that time. So in comparison to what Lester had gone through, what Juanita had gone through, I don't have any complaints. Why do you think it is that the church punishes the very people who help uh, instigate change within it? I don't think you need to point the finger just at the church. I think this is a, an institutional problem and not just within organized religion. That those who push the envelope are not likely to be welcomed in the short term. It can be in government, it can be in business, it can be in education. Uh, we like to think that we are a progressive society, but there's a lot of inertia that pushes back against that. I've seen this a lot in science, to my own surprise, that the nature of science should be that they are the most progressive people on Earth. But many, many scientists that I have dealt with will spend the first couple of years of their career staking out turf and the rest of their career defending it and pushing back against others who are going in a direction that casts doubt on their earlier work. So you're saying that's just a human phenomenon? It is a human phenomenon, yeah. But there are organizations that are graceful and respectful to those who who help promote change. I mean, the Dialogue Foundation would, would honor those who helped sure. do positive achievements in dialogue. Look at what the Roman Catholic Church has done to its scholars over the centuries. It's the same thing. Generally, they have not been welcomed, and sometimes they've been treated very rudely. Yeah. Much more rudely than our people have been. Right. So, uh, you, you mentioned the treatment of Lester Bush and Juanita Brooks, and you, you just talk a little bit, you make reference to how you've been mistreated. There's no stories you want to tell, or is that, is, do you generally prefer not to no, it's ever just, talk about negative things or sad it, things? It's not, it, it just hasn't risen to the level of significance compared to what they have been through. So for you, would you characterize your experience as a Mormon to generally have been very positive? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what feedback have you received, positive and negative? Let's start with the, the negative. Um, a lot of people want to know if you've ever had any negative feedback from the Brethren or official church sources about your books. Nope. None. Never? Never. Okay, what about hearsay of, of what different uh, church leaders may have thought or felt about your well. books? Well, <laughs> <laughs> when I was working on the McKay book, my co-author, Bob Wright, called me and he, he, 
he said such and such a general authority who was a neighbor of his had uh, happened to walk by his house one day when he was out gardening and mentioned the priesthood book and said, uh, Bob, it's off center. And Bob said, did you read the book? And the gentleman got a little bit huffy and said, well, no. <laughs> Uh, twice uh, I was told that the McKay book had been on the agenda of the Strengthening the Members Committee. And the church historian at the time told me that one of the members of the committee had seen him in the hallway and said, Marlon, I read that book. It's a good book. Mm -hmm. Th that's really about it. How about the Arrington book? In some ways, th this book made me most mad of all the books that made me angry. Because for me, yes, it's a it's a beautiful spotlight on Leonard Arrington, but it, it's sort of a scathing critique, although I don't think you intend it to be that way, on the extent to which the Quorum of the Twelve and the First Presidency were willing to hide uh, the the history of the church and punish anyone who spoke openly about it. So in that sense, it felt like a real condemnation. Have you received that? Any sort of feedback on this book yet? Mm -hmm. No. No. Oh. Okay. Um, how about well, positive? Uh, your positive feedback. Yeah, yeah. So let's, let's go back and just tell us positive feedback, both from church members, church leaders, and just people. Right. What, what types of feedback do you get about these books that maybe helps has helped keep you going over the past 24 to 32 years. Well, some, some strangely encouraging feedback on the priesthood book was that about a year after it was published, there was, as far as I can tell, the longest article that the Ensign ever published. It was written by Larry Porter, and it was on the restoration of priesthood. Uh, December 1996, I think. Anybody wants to look it up? And I read that and I thought, this is really strange because it seems like it's saying in a loud voice that my book doesn't exist without ever mentioning my book. And not long after that, I was with one of the 70s and I said, that thing said, seems to me like this is what has happened. He laughed and he said, you're a lot closer to the truth than you might think. And then decades later, I had a visitor, one of the BYU faculty, who was in the same ward as Larry Porter. He came and had dinner in our home. And I mentioned this and he said, I spoke to Larry Porter and asked him and he said, yes, they asked me to do exactly what you just described. So I thought, okay, which is basically say many of the same things you said in your book, but not give you credit. No, just the opposite. Say the Re opposite. Restating the orthodoxy in a loud voice without ever mentioning that there was any challenge to the orthodox view. So I thought, okay, at least it registered. <laughs> and now, between those three books, I don't know how many thousands of footnotes I have, but I have yet to have a single fact challenged in any of those three books. And there are a lot of facts, and a lot of them, particularly in the priesthood book, that are not the traditional story. There are multiple paradigms that are overturned in that priesthood book, uh, and yet nobody has challenged the overturning of those paradigms. So I think maybe in subsequent decades we'll find that some of the insights in that might seep into general church curriculum. Let's, let's uh, cross our fingers. Uh, but not hold our breath. How's that? Um, what are what are the five most important books on Mormon history, in your view, not including these books? <laughs> we'll, we'll put you off the hook. Now I only have to say two, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I still think that Von Brody's No Man Knows My History is one of the most important books. You can filter her bias, the chip that she carried into that. That's easy to filter. It is still 
a remarkable book written with remarkably good prose. It's an easy read. She wrote that, published that in 1945. It has never been out of print. And I think still today is just a remarkable biography of Joseph Smith that is willing to take him on in three dimensions. I think that Juanita Brooks' Mountain Meadows Massacre is an extremely important book, not only because of the depth to which she went in getting the story right without any help from the church archives, but also because it was one of the first books in the Mormon study genre that really attempted to be objective in its telling of history. I think that Leonard Arrington's Great Basin Kingdom, which was published eight years after Juanita's, Juanita's was in 1950, uh, deserves to be on that list because it, uh, even more so than Juanita's, he took a database approach to history. His PhD was not in history, it was in economics, but his specialty was economic history. And so that book is the result of assembling a lot of data points and then saying, what's the story? That's the approach that I took with all three of these books. So uh, other ones, interestingly, the book that turned me on to Mormon history was Nightfall at Nauvoo, written by Sam Taylor. It, it is not wedded to the truth throughout, but I felt that it was a very compelling story by a very compelling storyteller of the Nauvoo era of the church. Gee, what would another one be? And that's, that's four out of five. Okay. Since you didn't give me the advance notice. <laughs> Sorry. Um, is the LDS Church worthy of its members? And if so, how? The LDS Church is its members. It's no better than its members are, all the way up. Are the LDS Church leadership worthy of its members? I think the LDS leadership consists uh, of men mostly. I'd like to see more women in that hierarchy who are good men, who are well-intentioned men, they bring to the job what they had when they came into the job. And I think we often forget that. We do not have a professional clergy. That can cut both directions. There are some very good things about having a professional clergy. I'm getting to understand that now in my role as a governor of Wesley Theological Seminary in D.C., the only Mormon they've ever had as a governor, but that's giving me a lot of close association with professional ministers, and I can see a lot of things that make me very envious. But that said, we have gone the opposite direction of having a lay clergy. So when you get to any level in the church, you have what your professional life and your personal life have equipped you with, but you don't have any specific training in the ministry. That can be a plus if you've had good training in other fields, but it can be a minus because you may just lack those simple fundamental tools that make the ministry work within other traditions. So we sometimes think, well, why don't they understand some of these issues to a depth that we would like to have them understand them? And the answer is they likely were not called to that position because of their depth of knowledge in Mormon history and theology. And once they get in that position, they don't have the time to dig deeply. So you wind up with, well, I'll give you a, an, an anecdote that we talked about yesterday. Um, not long after the McCabe book was published, I got a phone call from Bob Bennett, who then was one of the two U.S. senators from Utah. Bob was a good friend. He also married one of David O. McKay's granddaughters. But he said, I love your book. I appreciate your candor, your willingness to tell the story as it is. And he said, let me tell you about an incident that happened to me. He said, I was in the Hotel Utah years earlier, and Harold B. Lee was in the lobby, and it was just the two of us. So we sat down and started to chat. He said, Bob, how's your brother? And Bob said, one of my brothers had been on the General Correlation Committee 
and got too close to power. Didn't like what he saw and walked away from the church. Bob said I had to be diplomatic, but I said, well, he's left the church. Why did he leave? Well, he got too close to power. He said presently, he said, oh, I can think of much better reasons for leaving the church. He said, doesn't he realize that we're just mortals doing the best that we can? And on a good day, when they're doing the best that they can, then very good things can happen. But it's not an automatic, and they work with the tools that they brought to the job. I think we often don't cut them enough slack, understanding that that's what they're dealing with. It was the McKay biography that really gave me that kind of understanding. I remember at one time, my mentor in pathology from UCLA was working in our laboratory in Maryland. He came back for a month and was working with our junior scientists. He didn't have anything to do in the evenings, so I said, here, why don't you take a few of these? And I gave him several of the notebooks that contained the McKay diaries. He'd had a little bit of association with Mormons because he'd done a collaborative project with the professor at the University of Utah, but other than that, he didn't know much about it. So he read several of these volumes, several hundred pages, and I said, what do you think? He said, well, if you take the proper names and change them, he said, this is just corporate politics. So outside of Mormonism, like in the history, world history, do you have a few heroes, like people you really think moved humanity forward, who were extra courageous. You don't even have to tell us why. Just like list, do you have any historical heroes? Oh, I, I think one of the great heroes in all history would be Abraham Lincoln. Okay, Abraham Lincoln. Who else? Uh, Jesus is pretty good. Jesus, okay. Who else? Any others? A couple more? Jesus is all right. We're, we're cool with Jesus here, some of us. Uh, I think there are a few scientists who deserve to be on that. Okay. Einstein. Einstein. Uh, Darwin. Okay. And what, do you, what is it about these men that you uh, respect most, just generally? If you had to list four or five characteristics of great men, what are the char- women, what are the, what are the characteristics? What they did lifted either an organization or a society or the entire human civilization. And often they did it in the face of substantial resistance. So why don't we have any Mormon apostles doing that in the modern time? Why, why don't we have any of those people? Every time I try and talk to you about frustrations with the leaders, and honestly, your books do a really good job of showing the human side of them. But I want to just ask you, why don't we have more heroes coming out of the Quorum of the Twelve and the First Presidency? I don't know how to answer that question. I wish we did have those who rose higher. Uh, I know that in the non-Mormon world that I travel in, there is respect towards Mormonism. There's respect towards me as a Mormon. But we on our side bemoan the fact that we're not taken seriously. And yet when I talk with these people, I understand why we're not, and that is that what we produce doesn't resonate beyond the walls of Zion. It is our responsibility to produce something that catches the attention of the world. If we do that, then we will get that attention. I just don't see that outside of Mormonism, what's done within Mormonism has had much effect on the world. Because wouldn't it be wonderful, I mean, we all look, for example, to Uchtdorf and say, oh, he's the great hope of progressive liberal Mormonism. Wouldn't it be great if he could find a way to go rogue or speak out or stand up and be courageous, right? Or Holland, you know, uh, what, what do you think keeps them from being able to truly do something courageous and noble? There was a brief moment in time when President Uchtdorf, in fact, was on the world stage. My daughter had been a White House intern in the first Obama administration. And uh, at the time, she was the highest ranking Mormon in the White House as an unpaid intern. (laughs) (laughs) Which, Which tells you part of our problem. But I got to know one of the officials in the Office of Public Engagement. And in talking to him, 
I said, um, what's your back channel to Salt Lake? He said, we don't have one. We need one. So I mentioned President Dukdorf's name. And just by coincidence, a few weeks after that, President Dukdorf was in D.C. and spoke at the banquet of the BYU Management Society. Jalen and I were out of town, so we didn't go to that. But Paul was invited and thought, well, I'll just go see what's happening. And they seated him next to President Dukdorf. By the end of the banquet and his speech, Paul was converted to President Dukdorf. <laughs> and for the next couple of years, the White House was trying to figure out how do we get this man in front of the president? Because they could see that there was the potential of a relationship there that would be very beneficial. They were contemplating doing it during the state visit of Angela Merkel, but they decided not to because they said that'll give him 30 seconds with the president. We need more than that. So eventually they did it um, for a White House meeting on immigration. They invited 14 religious figures, including President Dukdorf. Paul was the one who set the meeting up, and he said, um, I set up the seating assignment. They were in the cabinet room, and there's the long rectangular table. The president sits in the middle, and President Dukdorf was directly across from him. And then Paul was seated against the wall behind him. I saw one of the photographs from the White House later. But of the 14 religious figures, 13 were wallpaper. The whole point of the meeting was to introduce these two men to each other, and Paul said there was electricity between the two of them. A year later, I was invited to the prayer breakfast, the Easter prayer breakfast in the White House. That was in the East Room, and I didn't know in advance that one of the other invitees was Dieter Uchtdorf. He was seated a couple of tables away from me, and at the conclusion, uh, the announcer said, please remain at your tables because the president will come around to each table and pose for pictures and greet everybody. He came to our table first, and then I watched as he went over to the table where President Uchtdorf was. I was only probably 20 feet away, and it was absolutely clear that there was genuine affection between those two men, that there was an enormous amount of respect. Uh, that dissipated, but it was not because of the administration. There was a subsequent invitation that came from the State Department um, that was declined. By a church headquarters? Yeah. Uh, and I knew what was in the invitation because they asked me to write it. Do you have any theories on what happened or why? I think that perhaps he was getting too much recognition. That was a time, though, when the LDS Church was poised, I think, at potentially a very beneficial position. But I think that had that relationship been allowed to flourish a little bit more, it would have put the church in a very, very good light. You almost get the sense that for, for a few years, Uchtdorf was sort of out in front taking that courageous role. And then he sort of got muted. Or do you think that, that the events with Obama and the subsequent sort of uh, closing the curtain on that by others who may not have liked that association was also part of his sort of maybe silencing? It, it's speculation, but yeah, that's where I am. And I saw it from a fairly close vantage point from the Washington end of things. Yeah, because I remember uh, talking to you years before the recent demotion of Dieter Ruchtdorf where you maybe had expressed that you were concerned that he was being silenced. Is that, did I remember that? I right? wasn't the only one who was feeling that way. Right. Can you tell us uh, what you think about the change in the first presidency, recent change where, where Uchtdorf was demoted? Did you, did you anticipate that? Yes. And where Oaks was elevated. Talk about what you think happened there and well, how you feel about it, what it means. In, in defense of the status quo that we now have, it is the prerogative of the president to choose his counselors. It's the prerogative of state president, of a bishop. Uh, what happened, though, was that subsequent to the death of Brigham Young in 1877, 
only on two occasions was a sitting counselor in the first presidency not retained by the succeeding president. One of those was in 1970 when President McKay died and Hugh Brown was released from the first presidency and resumed his position in the Quorum of the Twelfth. Likely for his advocacy in favor of blacks receiving the priesthood? Well, that's according to his grandson who told me exactly that. He said, my grandfather told me that he was released from the first presidency because of his attempt to reverse that policy on ordination. Okay. Uh, the second was when Spencer Kimball died and Marion Romney, who had been uh, in very poor health, really non-functional intellectually for some years, uh, was quietly released from the first presidency. Those were the only two since the death of Brigham Young. Uh, so it even though it's the prerogative of the new president to choose whomever he wants, there was also a strong precedent for not releasing the sitting counselors, and that's what made it unusual. Uh, going back to when David O. McKay became the president in 1951, Reuben Clark, who had been the first counselor, was demoted to second counselor, and Stephen Richards was the first counselor. That was very unsettling to Clark, and it was devastating to a lot of the people who felt that Clark was their hero. Uh, but again, it's the prerogative of the president. If you look at the relationship between President Nelson and now President Oaks, there has been a very close working relationship between those two for a long time. And so I don't think it's really surprising that President Nelson would want Down Oaks as one of his counselors. The question then would be, who goes? How did it make you feel, and what do you think it means for the modern church to have Uchtdorf demoted and Oaks promoted? I think it disappointed a lot of people who loved President Uchtdorf. Uh, I don't know if they have ratings on whose general conference talks are the most favored, but I would guess that his is at or near the top. Uh, he's a remarkable person. I have not had any contact with him since he returned to the Quorum of the Twelve, but people I have talked to say he's fine where he is. He loves his assignment in being the supervisor of the European areas, which is a natural for him. And I think there's the potential of irony here because he is only a couple of heartbeats away from being the president of the Quorum of the Twelve. And you have, aside from the first presidency, you have Russell Ballard, and then Jeff Holland, then Dieter Ruchtdorf. And it's possible not only that Ruchtdorf could be the president of the Quorum of the Twelve, which would make him the prime minister of the church. Understand that, that transition happened. This is when Holland becomes prophet, Ruchtdorf becomes President of the Quorum of the Twelve, is that what you're saying? Or even if Holland became a counselor, if President Nelson were to die and then President Oaks were to then pick him. You, you've got Russell Ballard in there as well. What I'm saying is that he's only a couple of steps away from being the prime minister, the head of church government. And he's only three months older than Jeff Holland with nobody else in between, so it's entirely possible that Dieter Ruchtdorf could one day be the president of the church as well. Wouldn't that be a twist of irony? What did it mean for you as an active Mormon? How did it feel to see Ruchtdorf demoted, and what do you think it means for the church? I, in the long run, I don't think that it's going to be more than a ripple. Again, this is the the order of church government, it may be disappointing to people. But to you, is it disappointing to you? It was disappointing to me, but it was not unexpected. There was speculation for a long time that if President Monson had died prior to Boyd Packer, that Boyd Packer would have sent Dieter Ruchtdorf back to the Quorum of the Twelve simply because they saw the world much differently. So you had been anticipating this? Yeah. What keeps you from criticizing the, the brethren just directly and saying they're disappointing, there's too many suicides, uh, they haven't been honest about the history, they're not being courageous, they're not being sensitive enough, they need to do more. You seem to really want to avoid just direct criticisms of them. 
I've got better things to do than criticize them. It's, it, it, it's not something that interests me. If you want to change the church, it's possible to do that at the grassroots level. And if you look historically, many of the most important things that have happened in this church happened because somebody at the grassroots got a good idea and did it and it worked and then it became church-wide. So that's certainly what I call trickle-up revelation is a very potent force, maybe one of the most potent forces in the church. But you also have to be politically astute. And the one thing that you can absolutely guarantee is that a frontal assault on the brethren or even the perception of that will cause them to dig in. And whatever you thought you were gaining, you're actually setting back. So that's part of why I wouldn't do it even if I were inclined to speak up publicly. It's counterproductive. If you want to change, you have to use different tactics. So, some would say that some of the biggest changes we've seen in the past 10 or 20 years have come as a result of sort of frontal attacks. We talked about this in my interview with you a year ago, but ordained women is an example where we saw a very direct attack uh, occur, and we saw several significant changes happen as a result. Uh, not the changes that many wanted, but we certainly saw women put more at the center. We saw changes in female missionary leadership. Uh, we saw the, the, the general men's priesthood session being broadcasted. Uh, I think we could list a lot of areas. We, we've seen changes in how the church talks about women, curriculum around women. Um, and then you look at things like CES letter or you know, uh, podcasts or uh, Mormon Think or all the ways that the internet sort of uh, really brought to light problems with Mormon history. And then we see things like the, the essays come out. So what would you say to someone who said, actually, external direct action can really, uh, and often in, in the cases of like polygamy, uh, can often be the deciding factor for significant change? I would say they're not in command of the facts. Why is that? There were a lot of things that were going on before ordained women came on the scene. And if you were to track what the eventual changes were, you would find that the antecedents had nothing to do with ordained women and that, in fact, ordained women probably set things back. I talked to Kate on three occasions over a period of one year, had lengthy conversations over dinner, and tried to say, look, we've been through this in the 70s with feminist movement in the church. It had nothing to do with the righteousness of their cause. It had everything to do with their politics. And things were set back because of the militancy in the 70s. I was in favor of their agenda, but it turned out that their politics worked against them. And I think the same thing has happened with ordained women. I told Kate, there will be a time when women will be asked to be at the table for important discussions on where the church needs to go. Is that if you go the direction that you're going, I can guarantee you that you and anybody with ordained women will not be at that table. Now, that's a prediction, and we'll see how that plays out. But this is what has happened in the past. The same thing you talk about the... the um, just, just really quickly, yep. regarding ordained women, I think there's a lot of people that I know and respect would say that the church has made you know, within the years following ordained women, several important changes regarding women. And and that's my opinion as well. I think what I hear you saying is those had nothing to do with ordained women. They had to do with other things that were already in motion. I think if you could see the larger picture and knew all of the pieces of the puzzle, you may find that the agenda may have advanced farther in the absence of that frontal assault than it did in the presence. But that's speculation, right? That's speculation, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, keep going with the other. Uh, you, you mentioned the church history essays. Those, in fact, started from within. I met, uh, this was in 2008, I think. The Mormon History Association meeting was in Sacramento. Marlon Jensen was the church historian and hadn't been in that job for very long. I'd gotten to know him when I was working on the McKay book, and so we were just sitting in the hotel lobby chatting, 
And he said, I'm getting a lot of phone calls from parents who said, my child went to the Internet and read something about Mormonism, and now he or she is gone. Which is the external pressure I was mentioning. Well, that was not external pressure. That was an internal person seeing a reality and responding from within. No, all I'm saying is it was probably Mormon Think or podcasts or websites or blogs that was providing this uncorrelated information. Or, or a lot of websites that were antithetical to Mormonism. Sure. Yeah, sure. And we didn't have a response. We were late to the game. So it was his initiative to go to the First Presidency and the Twelve and say, we have to be proactive on this. We have to write and post on our website essays on these thorny issues of our history and our theology because our silence right now is working against us. And so that was a movement from within that spanned several years. But it, 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 it was not pressure from outside groups saying, you've got to do this. It was a realization from the inside that, hey, Houston, we've got a problem. And the response came from the inside. That's true. But I do think it was, it was people who started speaking up and publishing things externally that got the members' attention that then made the people inside start oh, yeah. paying attention. Yeah, it, it was response to an external stimulus. Right. Yeah. Um, so you're saying external pressure is important, but, but direct assaults on telling the brethren what to do, how to respond to uh, those sorts of forces, is often counterproductive. I, I haven't seen an instance where it's productive. Okay. It's not to say that we are not in need of change. It's not to say that members don't have perhaps even an obligation to do something about it, but it's to say that you got to be politically savvy so that you are able to move the ball forward instead of having it move backwards. Uh, one of the most common questions I get is, is it possible that some of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve or the First Presidency no longer believe that the Church is really true? Um, are you aware of that ever happening in the history of sort of the Quorum of the Twelve or First Presidency where someone that high has lost their faith? I'm not aware of it, but I haven't had those discussions. I don't know very many of those men. Yeah. I really don't. Yeah. It's a small handful, but I have gotten to know that small handful reasonably well, and on occasion we've had some really enlightening discussions uh, that have been very helpful for me, and perhaps they've been helpful to them. Um, what is your assessment of the state of the church right now? How's it doing? Give it a grade in terms of health. Uh, you want a letter grade yeah, or letter one grade. to ten? Or letter grade. Letter, letter grade. grade. Health. Health of the church. C. Okay. Well, where is it ailing? Uh, I think the biggest challenge we face right now is a challenge that other religious institutions, particularly Judeo-Christian religions, are experiencing, and that is the youth. Nobody is winning this battle. And I say this largely by sitting with the Wesley people. Now, Wesley is the largest uh, Methodist seminary in the country, but half of its seminarians are not Methodist. So they cut a broad swath. They have a large grant from the Lilly Foundation for the purpose of trying to figure out why are millennials not engaging institutional religion and how can we reverse that trend? So it's not like Mormonism is experiencing a crisis that nobody else is. Everybody is experiencing this. I think it's heightened for us. Uh, and I hear figures from enough directions to give them credibility, even though they're not published figures. Figures such as we lose 50% of our return missionaries within five years of their return. I'm hearing recently from several directions that we may have as many as a third of our missionaries returning home early. Uh, if you triangulate to the retained membership, not the 
raw number of convert baptisms, but try to figure out how many of those stay. My best estimate is that it's between 10 and 15 percent. And I think that may relate directly to the extraordinary attrition that we have in our return missionaries. If you're going out and spending two years and 90 percent of your converts aren't sticking around for a year, what is that saying to validate the time that you spent out there? I think we have been slow to respond to the challenges that the Internet has posed to us. The Internet is agnostic. It's just a highway. It's the traffic that's on the highway that can be the challenge. And we have been late to the game there. We still have not really laid out our history and our theology in a manner that I think stands up to critical scrutiny. I think that we have allowed our curriculum to become moribund, that by recycling an adult curriculum for, what, 40 years now, uh, that you not only run the risk of boring your people, you're boring them. <laughs> but I even hear this among the youth. If they say, my church experience is boring, we've lost. We've got to be able to figure out how do we rekindle that enthusiasm in the church that was there when I grew up in the McKay years. We can do it. When I was on the High Council one time, Bill Marriott was the stake president. And he came to our board conference one time and he spoke about his great-grandfather, Elijah Sheets. I think it's safe to say that Sheets will forever hold the record of longest tenured bishop, 48 years. I don't think that's in danger of being broken now. But I went up to him afterwards and said, I have been encountering the name of Elijah Sheets at the time I was working on the priesthood book. And I said, if you ever go out to Salt Lake, you may just want to ask in the historical department to see the ward minutes, because there will be a lot in there about your great-grandfather. A few months later, after high council, he says, come out to the car, i got to show you something. There is a machine, and I've seen one at the National Institutes of Health where I used to work, that will convert a 100-foot roll of microfilm into a really long roll of paper. It's just a continual printout of that, and he had four of these rolls in his trunk. So I didn't ask for these, but they sent them to me. It was the historical record of the Eighth Ward where his great-grandfather had been the bishop. He said, I don't know what to do with these, so I volunteered to do something with them. And I went through and I extracted all of the interesting things about Sheets. But in the process, I thought, my gosh, this is the compelling history of the church. It's not the great men and the great events at the top. It's the grunts in the trenches who week after week are making this thing work and showing extraordinary faith in the process. And I told Marlon one time, you could have a curriculum that would not repeat itself for decades that could draw only on the 19th century ward histories and everybody would be on the edge of their seats for those lessons because this is such compelling material. So it's not for lack of the material there, it's that we have lacked the imagination to dig into that and to re-energize the church by showing them what this thing really can do and what it did in its formative years. So if the church were to come to you and say, Greg, we're losing people, help us fix it. Do you have any idea what you would what you would recommend or suggest? You think spicing up the curriculum is, is going to get people out? I would say, if you're really serious about this, let's convene Salt Lake One. What does that mean? That's a reference to Vatican One and Vatican Two. Okay, and what would that look like? That would look like having a real discussion with broad representation that would be willing to put everything on the table, everything, and say what stays, what goes, what's not here that needs to be here, and reinvent the church. Are there some things you would, you would want to put on the table? Yeah, I'd brighten up the curriculum, among other okay. things. Okay, brighten up the curriculum. Give us four more. No, I'm not going to go down that road with you. Why not? No, seriously. I don't want to preempt the 
prerogatives of the people who will be at the table when that happens. Now, I think, though, if you want to make a substantive change, you've got to be willing to take the entire church program, lay it out on the table, and say what's working, what's not working. I'll give you an example. When I was doing the priesthood research, I found an unpublished book in the church archives that I copied, and it was a report by the Correlation Research Committee. That's an exciting title. In 1961, President McKay appointed Harold B. Lee as the head of the new correlation movement. The church had been trying to correlate itself since 1908, and there had been several committees, some of them even called correlation committees, over the ensuing decades, and they had always fallen short. So this time they wanted to make it work. Lee turned to Anton Romney, who was a professor at BYU. He was also the brother of Marion Romney of the Quorum of the Twelve. And he said, I want you to put together a committee that will look at all of the records and lay out what has been the history of the church's attempts to correlate itself and then make recommendations for what we should do. So these guys went and, uh, guys, I know, but that, that's the way things work and still are to a large extent, but they spent six or eight months, and they produced a report about an inch thick, uh, went through all of the history, and then said, none of the auxiliary organizations as currently constituted in the church are functioning the way they should be functioning. We recommend that they all be dissolved, and that in their place there be three new organizations one for the children, one for the youth, and one for the adults. And here's why. It was a very well-thought-out plan. It would have worked. It certainly addressed the current issues. Now, this is 1961, so they were having problems with boredom then as well. They presented this to the subcommittee of the 12th. And it's right in this report what the response was. And the response was, thank you, brethren, now go back and do it again, and this time don't get rid of anything. There's your problem. We, we have been very good at adding. We have been very poor at subtracting. And sometimes to move ahead, you have to get rid of some of the things that you got now. So I have, and, and I think most people here have a lot of respect for the work of historians and for your work, okay? And I'm just going to say that when you think about the, you take all the people that have made, all the Mormons in the 21st century that have made significant changes to their lives with respect to their relationship to the church. I'm going to posit, and I don't mean this in any way to sort of be insult, insulting, because I obviously have you here and not other people because of my respect for you. But if you think about the ways that a history book has moved people over the past 10 or 20 years, I think they've definitely had important contributions to make. But if you look at, at what certain podcasts have made uh, over the past 10 years, let's say, if you, you know, let's just say Mormon Stories, Year of Polygamy, Infants on Thrones, Mormon Expression podcast. If you look at what certain website, the impact that certain websites have made, like Mormon Think or uh, Letter to a CES Director, those are having what I would call massive and significant impacts on on the day-to-day -day lives of Mormons. Even the essays themselves are causing a lot of people to change their relationship with the church. And I guess I want to ask you, you know, if we're trying to move the needle, why is it that websites and, and blogs and podcasts and and ebooks that are just summaries of church history are seeming to have such a profound impact on people? And how does that make you feel as a historian? When you do the eight, eight years per book slog to write a book like this, and they're having a, an important impact, but, but it seems like some of these other things are, are having a bigger impact. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I think, cause you, I, I think it's a natural relationship tension between content and media. And some of the content uh, is going to be much more difficult to 
put together. And as a historian or as a scientist, you have to be willing to say, my work is to get the content right. And it may not be that I ever get the credit for it or that what I produce will directly affect the discussion, but it's going to feed into that. And it may be the media people then that really get the message out so that it starts to have the broad effect. I'm fine with that. And I applaud you and so many others who have harnessed the power of the Internet to get that message out there. I don't have that capability. I can provide some of the grist for the mill, but you are the mill. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I mean, I have deep respect for you, for Michael Quinn, for Carolyn Pearson, for Leonard Arrington, Lil Ben, and just all these amazing giants that we stand on. I just, I'm just thinking about how to move the needle more. And what you're representing tonight and what you've always represented is sort of this very diplomatic, strategic, um, kind of a deliberate uh, approach uh, that is really statesmanlike, but at the same time in the 21st century, uh, things just kind of step in and, and really move tens or hundreds of thousands of people at a very fast pace. And so it just makes me sort of ask you, you know, do you ever feel like um, activities kind of passing things by? I mean, you look at the where dialogue is now, where Mormon history is now. Um, you know, it's it's got to it's got to be weird to see all the scholarship that's been built up over decades, in some ways to be viewed as, as less important now as sort of all this on, online stuff. And well, I'm not at all concerned about who gets the credit. I'm concerned about what gets done. Right. And if the primary movers, if you go back to the first cause, are bypassed in the credits at the end of the movie, that's okay with me as long as the movie is reaching the audience that it needs to. And uh, I think it's the cumulative effect of a lot of scholarship but a lot of thought that is peripheral to the scholarship that eventually gets us moving. I think that there is movement in the right direction amongst the laity. The one thing that I would wish for for the laity, for the people in the pews, is that they would own their religion. You've heard me talk about this before. It's not a concept that I thought up. It came to my attention when I was working with Helen Whitney on the PBS documentary on the Mormons that was broadcast now, 11 years ago. Towards the end of her pre-production work, she said, I've interviewed hundreds of Mormons. You have a very good religion, but your people need to own it. They're borrowing it. And she was right. We have gotten very lazy, and we have been aided and abetted in our laziness at all levels going right to the top. I'll give you an example of the flip side of that. When I interviewed Hugh Nibley for the McKay article, he said that he had been asked to write a priesthood manual. This was in, I think, 1957. Those of you who have as many miles on you as I do may remember that. It was an orange Melchizedek priesthood handbook, and I think it was called An Approach to the Book of Mormon. He said, I finished the manuscript. I turned it in. He said the re reading committee just savaged it. They changed everything, and I went to President McKay and said, this is what they've done. McKay told the committee, put it back. And they said, this is over people's heads. He said, then let them reach. That's where we should be. We have flipped that, and we have taken things to such a low common denominator that maybe we're reach reaching some people at that level, but from that level on up, we're just boring people. And that's lethal. So if you're not going to get it through the church curriculum, then get it some other way, and you don't have any excuse now because you all have access to the Internet. But you don't own your religion just by showing up on Sundays. These, your history, your theology, your sociology are complex. They are nuanced, and you don't own that by just showing up. 
this is what really bothers me about the laity, particularly when I hear them complaining. I just want to shake them and say, go out and do your homework first, and then let's talk. Um, and I just, I just wonder, so many of us, so many people are leaving the church, and so many feel like this is a really critical time. And for someone who still, I know, really wants people to not abandon the faith and to, to stay within it, I just wonder how you restrain yourself from things that might be more direct and more bold. Because some would say, I think I've heard you say this, that the ship is sinking, the good ship Zion is sinking, and the brethren are rearranging the chairs on the deck. No, you haven't heard me use that metaphor. You may have heard me use another marine metaphor, and that is we have enough barnacles on the hull of the ship that it is slowing in the water. We need to chip off those barnacles. In other words, just subtract the things that are no longer working and get this ship moving forward again. So you don't think the ship is I've sinking? I never said that it was sinking. Okay. No, but even now, you don't think it's sinking? No, I don't think it's sinking. It's a large enough and durable enough institution. It's not in danger of extinction. It is in danger of being marginalized, particularly as I see the flood of youth that are walking away from it. That's your seed corn. You don't eat your seed corn and, and um, prosper into the future. We've got to fix that as well as other levels, but I think that our greatest concern should be on the younger generation within this church. Again, though, this is not a unique problem within Mormonism. This is society-wide, and not a single denomination that I'm aware of has figured out the answer to it yet. 